Welcome to the NFT podcast, Ryan and Paul. And so, where are you and how are you? I'm Paul Becker. I'm based in Vancouver, British Columbia. I'm chief curator of Art Rapture and founder of Art Rapture. Yes, and I am Ryan Watson. I'm um, in the East. He's in Vancouver. I'm in the capital of Canada in Ottawa. And uh, I'm co-creator, co-curator at our Rapture and uh, communications director. And really, we just have a huge passion for art in all forms. Uh, Paul and I met uh, many years ago um, working on cruise ships. So we were actually art directors and art auctioneers selling fine art on luxury cruise ships that cruised all over the world. And we had an opportunity to live and work with uh, master artist works as well as living artists that were established artists in all different types of mediums and uh, we did that for a good while we were very successful with it uh, we did it separately we uh, we met our wives at sea uh, and uh, we continue to to be with them which is awesome for them but probably more us uh, and uh Sometimes. With, yeah, sometimes, exactly. <laughs> so, But with the real passion of art, uh, Paul and I obviously stayed uh, in touch being apart, uh, obviously him being on the West Coast of Canada. And uh, uh, Paul can talk a little bit more about Art Rapture, how its kind of inception happened and uh, how it brings us to kind of today. Yeah, it's cool. Let, yeah. let, let us know Art Rapture more. Okay, sure. So I started Art Rapture, I think it was 2015 or 2016. Uh, as Ryan had alluded to, got off cruise ships, hugely passionate about artwork. I mean, at the end of the day, for me, art is communication. It's been around before scripture. It's built in the threads of our DNA as human beings that art is important. And it, it uh, great art speaks to us. Great art sings to us. And I carried that real passion from my experience on cruise ships and brought it back to Vancouver when I decided to take that giant leap back on land. And for anyone who's worked on cruise ships before, you understand that transition is not always an easy one. Uh, but one thing that really grounded me uh, as I started to re sort of uh, climatize myself to to life on land in Vancouver was my passion for art. So I started going and meeting a bunch of artists and I'd start doing little auction gigs for other people's events. And just what I noticed was there was something lacking. Uh, it, it wasn't powerful enough. There wasn't enough focus on, you know, the collector and, and romancing the work and the story and the history of the work uh, to really make these shows exceptional. The lighting necessarily wasn't great. The venue was OK, but wasn't really designed properly for art. And so I said, screw it. I'm going to do this by myself. I'm going to create a company called our, an event called Art Rapture. We invited about 15 different artists to around a 3,500 square foot warehouse venue. I got financial sponsorship behind it. We got uh, beer sponsors, wine sponsors, alcohol sponsors. And then uh, we did a two day pop up show, brought in a construction team, built walls that looked like uh, that were corrugated metal. So it looked and felt almost like uh, a shipping yard, like shipping containers. And then we mounted art on these containers. We partnered with a charity. I ran a big VIP auction the first night. We raised a bunch of money for, um, you know, the fight against homeless, youth homelessness in Canada. And uh, then we had this great art and, you know, 15 different artists from around Canada. And the show, like, way exceeded my expectations. It, there was clear that there was a gap in the market in Vancouver for great shows. And I'm sure in Europe, these shows are common, right? In places like Madrid or... Uh, you know, London or Paris. And then in America, like LA and New York and Chicago, these shows are probably pretty normal. But for Vancouver, it was something that was missing. And we had a huge lineup, sellout crowds, and we sold a whack load of art. You know, we got amazing works in collectors' hands. And, you know, that's where it started. We called the show Art Rapture. I didn't know I was going to call the company Art Rapture, but we liked it. Because rapture is a word when you break it down in, in the dictionary and synonym, you know, it is a word that means, you know, euphoria, bliss, passion, joy, all these things. And so I created this company where like our vision is to achieve rapture through visual art. And that sort of the inception of our rapture, we carried that through with another big show where we brought Okuda San Miguel from, from uh, Madrid to Vancouver. We popped up a big mural in Vancouver. We had some of his artwork for sale, really cool 
a bull sculpture that one of my close friends collected. Very jealous of uh, that collection. I'd love it in my own collection. Um, and then I did some solo shows, one for Ola Volo, uh, one for Sean Jancy, who we definitely want to talk about today, two for Sean Jancy. And I, I, I took this sort of group mentality and then said, hey, I want to do some solo shows. And with Sean, it was a really interesting experiment because we took a guy who really hadn't sold any work outside of his circle of friends. But I saw this massive potential in the artist and just a great human. One of our core philosophies, is we only work with good people. Uh, I can't stand, you know, people that complain a lot and, uh, um, you know, expect us to the world to give them stuff. And and Sean's not that. Ola's not that. You know, real humble people. And we did a solo show uh, for Sean called "It Was a Very Simple World," and we, I was so incredibly proud of that project. We sold about 80, 85 percent of the show in two days, and then he had a list of like. 25 commission requests after that show and that's one of the proudest moments i've had in in my career as an art dealer and then we did a show the next year called pov which you know as we get down the discussions today we'll talk about more which is a point of view series and it was fun it was sexy it was hot it's cool and uh we sold a lot of the work out of that too and um you know then we've grown from there and now you know fast forward a couple years and it's like nft space and so working closely with the artists that are closest to Art Rapture and where we have a lot of mutual bond and respect for each other. And they put a lot of trust and faith into Art Rapture to do the research and the development and the understanding of the NFT market for them so that they can focus on creating really high quality, exceptional work for the NFT space. And then Ryan and I you know, do the evaluation of what's the best platform what should the price be? Do we focus on USD versus Ether? Uh, and, and, you know, dive into those realms and aspects and, and, and coach and manage the process when dealing with the platforms of choice uh, to make sure that everyone's happy. That's an amazing story and an amazing vision from Heart Rapture. And there are literally a lot of interesting points here. First of all, it's interesting for me to like understand what was like the biggest challenge in life because you said with Heart Raptor you brought something more contemporary into Vancouver. I don't know Vancouver, but as you said, it's a more a traditional city. So how did you make something like that? And second, like if if it was like more challenging doing something like this, so switching a, a city, a, like a taste of an entire city from traditional to uh, contemporary, of if it's now more difficult to change the taste of your audiences from like traditional to digital, thanks to NFTs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, good question. And you hit the nail on the head. I hope my camera doesn't uh, skip out here. It looks great. Um, in Vancouver, there's uh, what's quite popular in this city is we have a lot of beautiful nature. So we have mountains, we have oceans. And so our most famous artist of all time from this region, her name is Emily Carr. And she painted, you know, in the in the late 1800s. And her work was uh, exceptional because she spent a lot of time with the local indigenous people of this region. And her work almost exemplified, you know, these great landscapes, but they had this pulse, this energy about them, where it was almost a spiritual impact of the painting. And because of the popularity of that work, artists tend to be influenced in this region of the world by nature. And the thing for me, and I don't mean to be rude, uh, but I've just seen so many landscapes, it was enough, right? Like, I'm a fan of surrealism. Right. Like behind Ryan's head there, you've got uh, Salvador Dali from the Destino series. Uh, I'm a fan of more abstract and cubism work. Uh, this is a Stuart Stevenson behind me here. And it's got like this inspiration of Picasso, who's, you know, in my opinion, the greatest artist of all time, without question, without debate. Uh, and then, you know, more the stencil street art where you've got Banksy, who's obviously the biggest player in the market in that realm. But there's a lot of other great stencil artists in the world, too like Martin Watson and like this guy, uh, I Heart out of Vancouver as well. And, you know, that's the thing is this show, I wanted to bring forward that um, art that was more of a punch in the face uh, than it was like that easy, soothing um, landscape work. 
and I wasn't sure how the crowd would react because Vancouver is a little bit more um, traditional is a word, but I guess more like difficult in embracing things that are more risque or bend the boundaries. So as an example, in Europe, I see a lot of work like by this guy, Cleon Peterson. You know, he did work underneath the Tour Eiffel in Paris. Mm -hmm. But to get a Cleon Peterson mural in Vancouver, I think would be very difficult for the city to approve it. And so it's just kind of interesting. And I think that's what a big challenge that Rapture is like, how do we show the public here, um, you know, great quality work that might uh, at first appeal to them, be like, I'm not used to that. So th that's definitely a challenge uh, for sure. And but we overcame that quite easily. And I think it comes down to a, a couple of things, uh, Francesco. And I think the number one thing is, is passion. Um, I myself am a hugely passionate fan of artwork. And um, some of my great accomplishments is when I take a close friend of mine who's never acquired a work of art in their entire life. And they, in fact, think even spending a, a, a sum of, say, a thousand or two thousand euro on on a work of art is astronomical and completely out of the realm. But they will spend uh, three thousand euro on a television. Right. And helping them understand through the process of education and passion that art is so much more important and a house is not a home until you have fine art on the wall. And when you look at a BMW as an example, you wouldn't put $20 tires on a BMW. So why would you spend hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars on a home and put a hundred dollar artwork on the wall? It doesn't make sense. A house is not a home until you have fine art on the wall. And so, um, you know, it, through passion and through education, we've been able to overcome those hurdles. And then that helps open people's eyes and open the door to do realms of possibilities for their houses. And so again, back to that person who never wanted to acquire a work of art before, I now have those same people addicted and salivating to buy another work of art and can't wait for another art rapture show. And I go into their home and I'll like count the amount of pieces from our experiences, art rapture that they have in their home. And it's like, one of my friends is 15, right? He, he thought spending a thousand dollars on a work of art was insane. Now he has 15 works of art in his house for art rapture. And it's because they, they need the education and they need to understand the passion and then that historical importance and cultural relevance of what art truly is. And I think when we link that to answering the second part of your question, right? So now how do we go from that new comfort level with art, fine art in, in whatever that way is that you've collected to now saying, okay, so your, art's a, your house is a home, you have fine art on the wall. Now wait for a minute, now come onto your computer or your phone or your digital device and let's collect a digital piece that is not in your home, or I guess it could be in some random kind of digital display or what have you, but now how do we bridge that gap? And I think, you know, it really comes down to a few different things at play, but if we go down to the actual blockchain technology of it all, the token, which is the NFT, the non-fungible token, the whole idea of it, and then you attach to that token, either a JPEG or a movie or a picture or whatever, text, and then it's minted. It's still a token. You know, the token economics of it all makes sense to it. The blockchain technology of it is important to understand. Now, take that out of the context of everything else and bring it to an artist that, uh, like Emily Carr, which Paul referenced, we can go to Picasso back in the day. He's sitting in Spain in a beautiful uh, landscape and he's just drawing on a little pad of paper getting something down. Now, to take it from that pad of paper to a painting, to a lithograph, to a limited edition, to being priced, to being put into a show, to being then sold, I mean, that's not the artist, right? It takes uh, experts in all those different fields to, to really get an art, artist to that level of established. So mm. when we look at the NFT space, we see that obviously as a non-fungible token, the original OGs of the NFTs were you know, crypto people. It was people that were in the crypto space, in the digital space, creating digital works of art on the side or in their school or wherever. Um, and then figuring out like CryptoKitty is the best to watch, figuring out how this NFT token worked and then realizing it's unique. 
Mm. Let's talk about art, unique works of art, a painting, a one of one. There is only one of those paintings and only one collector can have it. Now, this one is a lithograph. It is out an edition of 350. So there are 350 original lithographs in this edition that exists, but only 350. So there's the scarcity to it, right? So when you start thinking of the dynamics of art and fine art and collectability, uh, and then you bring it to the blockchain, which has all these inherent scarcities and collectability to them, uh, and then you put in a time of our lives, that exponential growth, and, and everyone can do anything just by clicking on their computer and putting something in a search bar, all of a sudden you have people, and with lockdowns, you know, we're curious, we want to know what's going on. And so how do we make money? You know, people are thinking that, how do I make, and everyone's just there searching things. And then you hear this thing, NFT, that like since 07, 2010, 2000, like people have been doing this. But now we start seeing, okay, everyone's coming to this market. So now let's pause on that. Established artists in general, if they are artists as professionals and they are established and they continue to do their shows and they continue to do their graphic runs and their paintings and et cetera, well, that's someone who's established. So in the NFT space, I'm always going to recommend collecting an artist that is an artist that's established. Yep. That is so, and, and you talked about Gary V. You know, when we talk about uh, Gary V, sorry, when you talk about him and you start saying, he says, think about someone that's thinking 30 years from now and not 30 days from now. Mm -hmm. You know, he's dead right. You know, we're talking about 100%. artists that are doing it anyways. So if you can already love their work and collect their work in whatever medium, if it's the painting, amazing, the one of one, if it's the lithograph out of 350 and you get one of them, congratulations. If it's the NFT from that artist, the one of one or the limited edition, it's still the artist's work. It's, it's, it's the same collectability. So then it comes down to what can you afford that you're comfortable with and then pressing collect. And, and that's where we all kind of, it all comes together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well said. I think the only thing I'd add to that, uh, Ryan is, is sort of the two core values uh, of collecting for Art Rapture. And I had this uh, long before even Art Rapture uh, came to existence. So I had a, almost a, consultancy firm before at Rapture, which is called uh, Eric Becker Fine Art. It's my middle name is Eric. And two rules of collecting. One, love your collection. Only acquire. So if anyone says like, Paul, I want to, what would be a good investment? First thing I say is don't acquire art as an investment. It can go up in value. That's cool. It'd be great if it did. But stick to this and you'll never make a bad decision. One, always love your collection. Acquire what you like what you love and you'll never make a bad decision. That's so important. Quite because you like you love it. That's right? so important, of the, course. The second rule to collecting is evolve your collection. And what I mean by that is in addition to what Ryan's saying is when he's talking about limited edition lithographs and one of ones and what can you afford. So my easy example is like, hey, I love Cleon Peterson over here. This is a limited edition lithograph. It's not cheap. It's what I could afford at the time. I love it. It ticks the boxes. I collect it. I'm proud of it. I own it. It's authentic. It's wonderful. There's a story and history behind it that'll take me another 10 minutes to explain, but I won't do that. But then it's like, how do I evolve my collection? I've hit number one now. Love my collection. How do I evolve my collection? Well, I need a one of one original painting by Cleon Peterson. Absolutely. And maybe I can't afford it today but I'm going to strive to afford it. And I want to focus like that energy and that passion that people get and almost this addictive personality about collecting things into wanting something that's even more special than the last thing I got. Now it doesn't mean don't buy limited editions of any other artists. It just means for this particular artist, now I have a limited and to evolve my collection, I need a one of one. That's powerful. So it seems like that you like make auctions, you make exhibitions, you create artists, you sell, you collect. But there is also one fundamental point that you touch is educate. You educate people, you educate audiences and you educate, you educate artists. So in this era, especially in this year where NFT are booming and mm -hmm. you are like art curators, and uh, 
artists now they don't they don't really want to be curated like before because they discovered a powerful tool that are all these marketplaces and so they can just mean their nfts they can create and sell their their brand by themselves so how like the job of an art curator evolve this is it just edu- is it more now educating artists in what they do or is it something else Yeah, good question. I think I'll take a hit at this and let Ryan give his opinion as well on it. So I think the job of the curator is changing just as life changes so fast. And I think if you traditionally think of what a curator does, it's typically like they organize the show in terms of what art is going to be exhibited. And then they have a team of people that help put the pieces together and they focus on bringing that art together. As the world moves so rapidly, I think the role of the curator is changing, or at least it is for me. And I see it as being, you know, part and parcel to the number one foundation of a curator is ensuring there's great art by great artists. But then there's the business side. And that's um, aligning all the different things that matter. And when we look at NFT in particular, it's aligning the artist and the artwork to the correct platform. It's then finding to work with that platform to ensure that the artist is getting the exposure and support they require. And I fully understand that it's not easy. When we look at the the number of artists that are entering this space, a lot of them won't have the means of having someone like Ryan and I to help them through the process. And the reason we're able to do it is because our artists are already successful in the physical world. And so we're a lot we're, they're in in lockstep with us along for the ride of nft and making sure we figure it out correctly so that it's great art by great artists at great value for collectors but on the right platform and getting the right type of communications around it and i think that's for me what a curator is now as we start to rapidly evolve into introducing the digital world that changes so quick and I think um, to, to touch more on the side of education with it, right? So, you know, we have these established artists, but how it kind of came to vote is collectors came to Art Rapture that have already collected these established artists, physical works, and were asking us for the NFTs. Like, are these artists making NFTs and why not? And yeah. can I get this painting? Can I get this painting as an NFT? And so, you know, that made us really question what was going on because the collector is listening uh, and evolving, evolving the collection, right? So this is a different way of evolving. So now it goes to the artist and we have to educate the artist in all the basics of what an NFT is, how the blockchain technology works, why, you know, what is it about it? And is it an energy sucking thing that's like blowing up the world or is it based (laughs) on Ethereum price points and Bitcoin crashing and like, you know, if you go and start talking to somebody about cryptocurrency, like they're going to, if they don't know anything, they're going to say Bitcoin and it's crazy and it's vapor and whatever. Like, it's just the nature yeah. of it all. It's getting my, better. My conversation I, with my dad last night. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Exactly. And that's fine. And that's totally fine. But if you go into the conversation and not say a word about cryptocurrency, not say a word about Bitcoin mm-hmm. or even Ethereum and just start talking about authenticity, right? Uh, blockchain technology, the idea of transparency, um provenance which is a word that yeah. follows art since the beginning of time provenance is literally how did it go from the artist studio right the place that it was created to your collection so and important. having that map it's the most important piece provenance it's funny because they say when you collect or when you buy real estate they say you know location 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 with artwork, including NFTs, including anything that's from an established collectability factor is provenance. So known origin for us is the platform that Art Rapture uh, has chosen to work with and we've worked and they've chosen us and we've been working together with our artists and, and known origin. And there's a reason for that. You know, we want to make sure we're working with a team that is here for the long run. And yes, yeah. we realize that Ethereum, again, education, though, Ethereum isn't the be all end all blockchain. In my opinion, it's 2015 smart contract technology, but it is where the volume is. It is where everyone is living right now with all different chains everywhere. But really, that's where the fine art is if we talk about it that way. So educating the artist that isn't in blockchain, isn't in crypto and 
guiding them through the stages of a MetaMask wallet on Ethereum or EOS on Wax or you know whatever the story is, that's something that we bring to the table as well with Art Rapture is, uh, you know, we all have a huge understanding of the crypto space and have been since its inception since early on, uh, and it's just really cool that now we can kind of fuse the space with the fine art and and really kind of have some fun with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I totally agree. Um, okay, and let's touch another vertical of your business because I'm I'm very interested in covering that is auctioning, of course. So how yes. auctions are changing from 2020 and 2021 now that we see all these platforms like you mentioned non origin and then of course we're going to also talk about later about non origin and what you're going what you are you you're working on now, but basically auctions. What's the revolution now? Yeah. So, you know, it's a big, big uh, a topic to cover, but I think if we zero in specifically to, to NFT, um, there are companies that are doing auctions very well. And I look at uh, platforms like Nifty Gateway, um, and they've done a bang up job on addressing uh, the market really well from a open edition auction, a one of one auction, and maybe a larger limited edition auction. And I think it's smart, man, like it's really smart. Um, and for us, Ryan and I were, you know, we're, we're personality types at auctioning and Ryan actually trained me to be an auctioneer. So, you know, Ryan especially gets involved in, in charity auctions and you don't get that atmosphere uh, in the digital world on an auction versus uh, the physical world. But hear me out, man, like I'm a sponge. I love to learn. And so what the NFT space is teaching me about auctions, I'm going to start applying to the physical world too. So check this out. So normally I'll do like a physical auction. I'll get up on stage, do this big hoorah, have fun, crack jokes, you know, bang the gavel, you know, sell a bunch of stuff. Ryan and I have a whole bunch of tricks up our sleeves on how to sell multiples uh, and do mysteries and all sorts of cool things, which I think some of that technique can be applied still to nft and i think as known origin evolves or they've asked us to start helping them with some of those ideas but i think we're ways out on that to be honest but hear me out so seeing what nifty does with like an open edition auction where it's like we're open for five minutes and the edition is only as big as five minutes will allow so if 50 sell in five minutes the edition's 50. if 5,000 sell in five minutes the edition's 5,000. And Ola Volo and I are working in partnership with a company in Vancouver uh, later this year. And I'm going to apply that methodology to physical prints. And we're going to release for an hour as an example. We don't know the time frame now. Say an hour. However many sell in that hour becomes the addition size. And that's the number of prints we're going to go have printed and Ola sign and put in a tube and send to collectors. And I, I, like, I just get a lot of joy out of this stuff. Like I love learning about different techniques in different areas and then applying it in different areas of life. And I think what's really cool about the fast vociferous pace in which NFT is evolving and the amount of really intelligent and cool people that are getting involved in this space that you're getting a lot of wild new ideas. That's for sure. Cool, cool, absolutely. So you, you teach me a lot about like how to do an auction and like how to... I think it's interesting for, to see that you are learning from digital world and applying the same on traditional. And as you said, like non origin, you help them like in building like the, the, the auction process. So from traditional to digital world. And so let's yeah. talk more about non origin. Like how, how is born like this partnership, this, uh, when this want, wants, uh, of, of working together? And what are you working on now? Yeah, I think uh, the one one thing to say right off the bat is known origin. When we started chatting with them, uh, we're we're all in right away. Uh, we set up a, a conference call with them, had the whole team there, and really started throwing out ideas of what we were looking for for our artists as a platform, and then at the same time, what their platform could do with established artists. Now, obviously, they had. Uh, and have established artists in that digital space, but not necessarily as much in the physical world. So it was a neat kind of collaboration there um, as we started to work. And uh, I'll let Paul talk a little bit more about kind of what's coming out right now and what we're doing. But as we as we kind of worked on feature drops with them, um, which happened on Fridays, 
Uh, we have one coming up this Friday right now. I think this is going to air after one drop, but Olavola is, is coming out on Friday. May 7th. Um, May 7th, thank you. Uh, and so with feature drops, something different they hadn't done before was provide content about the artist. So it used to just be, you know, on Thursday at four o'clock, this artist is dropping these pieces. And these are the five that we've chosen uh, this week. But a feature drop, it was one artist that was focused on and then certain pieces in a collection for that drop specifically. And then when you clicked on the web page, it actually was full of content about the artist, the history of the artist, maybe some YouTube clips, some movies uh, showing the artist, some documentaries about the artist, anything to really show the collectors or just people interested in the artist's work more about the background to really give that, that sense and idea that you're collecting an established artist. So, and again, it comes back to my main point about Ethereum prices and all everything else. If you are collecting NFTs and you're serious about collecting, you're not looking at the daily price. You haven't looked at the daily price since $175 uh, four months ago, you know, and so, and you've still been collecting when it was at 1200, 1300, 2200, and now 3500, you're still going to be collecting at 10,000 an E and chances are you're not going to buy an E, you know, you have a collect, you have Ethereum, you've been collecting Ethereum for a long time. So that all said, finding the right artists to put that Ethereum in, essentially holding it. If you're a holder anyways, hold it in, you know, fine art that you know you can use, which is great, rather than just sitting in your MetaMask wallet. So there's there's kind of some fun plays there with Known Origin as well, but I'll let Paul talk a little bit more about how we've worked with them in collaborating into these drops and then um, specifically with Sean Jancy coming up. Yeah, so uh, to, to be brief on it, so May 7, I don't know when this is exactly going to air, but May 7, 2021, we've got a really cool feature drop for Ola Volo. Uh, I get text messages from her like yesterday saying how liberating this experience has been creating digitally. And so I'm having a talk with my dad last night and he's kind of, you know, a naysayer on NFT thinks it's going to disappear and go away. And I'm like, dad, that's cool. But you got to understand, like, let me read this text to you from Ola Volo. You know, she creates a lot of corporate work, right? Where or murals where there's you know regulations and some level of strictness around what can be shown and approving this, approving that. Well, with NFT, she creates digitally to start her work process anyway. Like it's a perfect marriage for her. She starts digitally anyway, if it's a painting, a mural, whatever it is. And she's now allowed herself to create something she's already comfortable doing without any restriction at all. And so I get this text from her saying how liberating the experience is creating this work for this drop tomorrow called Sirens, which is on Greek mythology and the Sirens and the story of uh, Odysseus or Ulysses uh, traveling back home and being, you know, caught up in, in, in the, the, the entrapment and temptation of Sirens. And she's so happy and feels so rewarded that the... Um, that the artwork she's created has had no boundaries and no one's told her what to do. And it's, it's pure, it's raw, it's genuine artwork. I'm just going to try to uh, fix my there you go. screen there. There we go. Okay. Um, oh no, I'm going to just look like a stoner there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so, so just on that point, like this is great that we've got artists that are, I, I'm going to stop my vid for a sec. That we yeah, no problem, we've got yeah. an, uh, 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 an artist who just loves the process and has adopted it and already understood digital to begin with. And that series drops and, you know, we've got Twitter going off the hook, Instagram going off the hook, everyone getting excited about this work. Our hope is that we get more transition from the physical collectors into NFT. It'd be really cool to see more of that adoption happen. But what's great with Known Origin in that relationship is they they help us and we have like a private discord channel just with them, the people that help the process out. And it, it's really beneficial for us to have those people to be like, what do you guys think of this? Is this okay? Like, Hey, I made this mistake. As Ryan knows, nothing makes me more aggravated than when I make a spelling mistake in my, uh, in my minting process, when I'm writing the description and go, Fuck, do I have to burn this thing now and like re mint it to get that spelling mistake out of the way? And which, which happens. Uh, but you know, Known Origins there to kind of tell me like you can do that or you can't do it and, and give me that guidance. Furthermore, with Known Origin, uh, we've got another drop next week, uh, May 13. 
And that's for an artist called Sean Jancy. And I'd actually like to share my screen right now, if you don't mind. Is that okay? Of course. Okay. Present now. Okay, so do you see that? Yeah, it's coming up. There yeah, you go. I can see it. Is it there? Okay, cool. So this is one work of a series of three that are going to come out from Sean Jancy next week. And they incorporate the POV uh, style that uh, many, many people adore. And he's got a lot of commissions out of the POV point of view style. They're fun. They're sexy. They're, they're easy on the eyes. But he also... Uh, draws inspiration from the greats like David Hockney and Tom Vesselman and other great pop artists. And Sean here has a, a series coming out called Dusk. And it's three point of view series, all based in a Dusk setting. And uh, a bit dissimilar to Ola, where Ola always starts digitally, Sean typically starts with a paintbrush. And so he's created all these paintings and has really he's self taught and hasn't gone to school for digital work at all. And I think that's what makes his work so raw and so real. And so then he started looking at, you know, Hey man, like I'm having fun with these NFTs. I don't want to be putting up, you know, photographs of my paintings all the time. Like, let me have a crack at painting digitally. And he just, I love it. And other people love it too. And this is just, you know, one piece. I'm going to drop my screen and, uh, and share, some, share another one. Sure. Yeah, and I think um, just to jump in, Paul, as you're, as you're showing it, we saw right off the bat with Sean Jancy and NFTs that collectors jumped on it right away. So this was, uh, I guess, mid-March, end of March. And the, his point of view POV works came out and collectors picked it up and NFT collectors that if you're in the Twitter world right now, uh, and if you're in the NFT space and you're building that NFT community with everyone else that's out there, including us at Art Rapture, uh, I think it's, is it Art underscore Rapture? One of the two, but yeah. find us. Uh, but yeah, so, but the one thing that... Um, that we've seen is that the big collectors in the space, like NFT girl, for a great example, yep. who's just been Shout an amazing, out. Oh my goodness, man. Her support of the NFT space in general has been phenomenal from like Decentraland to NFT art all over the place. Like she has just been phenomenal for the space, uh, her and her crew, to be honest. And she collected Sean Jancy right when he came out right off the hop, a lot of the Genesis pieces she grabbed and you know, his work, it, it's just spun so much energy to it. So, uh, Paul, did you uh, did you find that other one for Dust? Yeah. So, I just want to know: Did I share the one with the cerveza or the one with no, the, no. the hands? The and hands, we, yeah. With the hands, okay. yeah. Yeah. Okay. This one's popping up. Wow. Well, so this one. So this one's got uh, some. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Yeah. There. there? It is. Yeah. So this one's got some great vibes yeah. to it too, right? And you know, this just it makes me want to be there. <laughs> right and i love that about art and this could this is digital it's on my screen i'm looking at it right now guys and i legitimately am getting a smile on my face looking at it right <laughs> and i've got a painting by sean a pov painting in my office as well once i stop sharing this i'll maybe put my screen on and, and show you but i really like how sean's adapted to this world and jumped in with both feet with energy and passion and wanting to not just do something quick and easy but he'll like he'll message me at like 2 a.m and he'll be like i'm poking my eyes out right now i've been looking at my ipad for 14 hours straight <laughs> working on this piece and i'm like bro go to sleep man like wake up and work on it the next day but he's the point is, is he's just so passionate about it and he's having it's re, it's a rewarding experience for him so we're looking forward to next week's drop on known origin sean jancy dusk series yeah solid cool can't wait so and 
that's a drop like on origin and that's very interesting for me to see that you're working with them because i i love the business model of the platform that they've got few artists i i was reading now they've got just about 2000 uh, artists so they want to be small they want to be they want to keep this like hell italian model and i really like it because for 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 you that i come from a traditional world maybe it's better uh, also because we're, what we're talking about, so working in a, in, a, in a small environment, like changing the taste of your audiences in Vancouver, I think that's, of course, cool. Um, yeah, so what's next? This, like, this everything that you want to share about, or is it something that you want to talk about, maybe exhibitions, because you, we, we, we talk about, like, auctions, we talk about artists, but what about exhibitions? Are you how yeah. and if are you going to mix uh, like digital yeah. world and traditional world in your exhibitions? For example, are you going to create a virtual or a digital exhibition into uh, crypto voxels in, into the central end, or maybe you prefer to make a traditional exhibition and put some digital screen on them and like created maybe uh, put some voir on it uh, in the sense that you're going to mix digital and traditional in this way yeah yeah man great question yeah <laughs> like, great great question so uh in canada you know, I, we're not I, the I made this question also because i want to do it too so i want to learn from yeah. you guys and have some inspiration exactly. it's great. <laughs> Perfect, i think man. everyone's so gonna have a different approach but we all that are taking the space seriously we want to we want we want to do something to bridge right and, you know, having chats with Ryan last night about this, um, unfortunately, in Canada, our COVID response is pretty slow uh, for vaccination. So I don't see any big shows this year, period. So I'm already planning next year. And I want to do a, a really strong, big, huge show in Vancouver, my biggest show yet, uh, called uh, Odyssey. And it'll be all based on uh, artists drawing inspiration from poetic verses from Homer's Odyssey, one of the most important works of literature ever. I want to have international artists. I want to have local artists. I want different cultural backgrounds from the artists. I'm thinking of bringing a Nigerian artist and getting an African's interpretation of the story of uh, Odyssey. Thinking of even stencil artists like iHeart, like how does he bring his modern day satire into taking the stories from, you know, pre-biblical times uh, into his sort of realm of possibilities but then talking about specifically what you're saying, Francesco, is like, how do we look at NFT for this? One idea, and my, our ideas will evolve, right? They will evolve over time. But one idea I have is like having a wing in the, in the exhibition with the TV screens and NFTs on display. Let's use Ola as the example here. So we have Ola Siren Paintings. Uh, which, you know, is from, you know, uh, uh, Odysseus's journey to, to, you know, the sirens tempting them in and, and, and holding them in and having love with them. And then also the NFT displayed in the digital wing. And then big thing for me is like, I want to help convert the process of physical collectors to understand, actually put some energy into NFT. And I'm like, me, there's a lot of crypto companies in Vancouver. Maybe we partner with a crypto exchange and maybe we offer uh, a very inexpensive or complimentary NFT for anyone who signs up for a wallet. And they have their own little booth there in the NFT wing and they sponsor it. And so now they're bringing on clients and we're showcasing great NFT art. And then maybe we have a series of paintings that people want to acquire, but you can't acquire it unless you acquire it as the NFT and you get the painting and the NFT. And so this isn't in stone, right? This is just what the thoughts are going through our head in terms of what can we do to help curate that process of converting a physical collector into digital and vice versa, a digital collector into physical so that we all understand that NFT is just a new way to collect fine art. It's a new medium, Just right? like an etching, just like a silk screen, just like a lithograph, just like a painting, just like a sculpture, just like performance art. How do you 
collect it and make everyone understand that this is just an additional thing you should have in your collection. Yeah, and I think when you when you talk about too, like you know, collectors and you talk about putting on exhibition and and now with COVID and um, you know, some parts of the world always dealt with having airborne or, or you know, different viruses. So you wear masks and there was already some sort of protocols in place in different places in the world. But when we talk about now and everyone's comfort level with remote uh, working yeah. Yeah. or, you know, the calls that we're on right now. Yeah. So I think we're looking now at this synergy of not just the NFT and the physical art, but now we have this big exhibition. It's going to be huge, but you're going to have collectors from all over the world that have collected nfts of these artists because by the way they're established artists that do physical work that are now in the nft space and vice versa so now our collectors that are from all over the world and aren't traveling to vancouver to be at the show Good are going to be able to be at the show with their oculus you know if they have that or in their vr we're going to make it easy and that's one of the big things the hard part of a blockchain and crypto in general is the price of admission is tough it's, it's not an easy thing to get into. Like you can download an app and, and buy some crypto, but if you really want to understand the ins and outs and really get into the fun stuff, it's hard to, you got to download this thing. You got to feel a little bit like a hacker, yeah. you know, and that's kind of fun. How many but, bloody wallets do I have now? Yeah. Like how does this work? And did I send it to the wrong one? And did I just lose my NFT? Like there is all those things, but if we can make it easy and for the people, again, the people that already live it, they'll be happy to join just like Decentraland, joining our Decentraland Odyssey or however that's going to play out. Yeah. But I think you have to think of it, Francesco, as you just mentioned, if you're going to start a show, an exhibition live, it has to be also available digitally. You have to think about that conversation. You have to bring in partners to be able to bridge that gap, because if you're just looking to do the individual piece of just paintings or the prints or that one off, you're missing out on tons of collectors. And it's mm. not just a money thing. Global. We said before, you have to love your collection and involve it. It has to be accessible. Let the collectors collect the artwork they want to collect, make it accessible for them. So those are some mm. of the pillars that we're working with to kind of bridge all these, these newer gaps in the, uh, in the market. Mm. Cool, Good of point, course. Right? And you need to guide them also because of course, otherwise you're going to miss a lot of opportunities. I see a bunch of opportunities here, like in mixing. So you can you can have new sponsors, as you said before, sponsors in the in the crypto in the in the crypto space. You are going like to think how can you you engage virtually and like physically people at the same time. How can you make them communicate? So it, for me, it's also a, a layer of networking for these people. And it's interesting what you said about how can I guide and educate my audience in building nfts so you were used to buy like the physical one no you need to buy an nft and you will have a physical one so i educate you and they give you like two other prices of one and uh, that's powerful because you can yeah. show in, instead of showing a picture to your friends when you are at the bar and say hey i just bought this no I, 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 can, I can show you my NFT from my NFT platform that's, of course, more engaging and they're at the beginning because they will be more and more engaging time, time over time. So I think that's an yeah. amazing point. Well said. Um, yeah. I think there is a last project that you wanted to talk about that is POV that you mentioned at the beginning. Uh, that's the one we talked about with Sean Jancy with the POVs for oh. the drop next week. Ah, okay, okay, okay. As we're talking Okay, here, okay, I didn't just, remember it was the name. But okay, yeah, please. No problem. As, as we're talking uh, here, you know, it's, uh, something has come to my mind. Like, it's it's pretty cool. So here's a, here's a call to action for the digital artists in the world, right, that are doing amazing things that have been in NFT since inception that maybe watch this, get a whiff of it. Here's my call to action for for the digital artists out there. I want to see some physical work. Hear me out. I've got physical artists that are putting in a lot of effort to transition to create digital work and get involved in this space because they're artists and they create. And the core and crux of who an artist is, is you take your soul, your spirit, and you pour it out into whatever the medium is for other people to enjoy. If you're a digital artist and you're making amazing work, from like a animated perspective, a 3D work perspective. I want to see some of your physical work and you hit me up at paul.becker at artrapture.com and we'll talk about having you at my show next year.
<laughs> that's amazing and i also like envision on the another thing another fun stuff so imagine that you're a digital artist and you don't really don't know how to do a traditional piece in the sense a physical piece of what, what you created digital you can partner with a traditional artist so that's like sure. a business opportunity for a traditional artist that is not going it's not too good with digital tools and of course i i understand yes. that you, you don't want to learn those tools because you are so old school that you want to stay in your lane and so like mix these two person and I can never imagine like the powerful artworks that can rise and born from it. Yeah, I think that's great. And it, you know, valid point, Francesco, about leveraging people that have skills in different areas. Like, uh, you know, there are definitely, you know, 2D work done digitally by an artist, but they don't know how to animate it. And then leveraging animators to help animate the pieces that they want to have animated. And in that same token, you just said, like, if you're a digital artist and you don't know how to do physical, partner with a physical artist to either teach you the ropes or to assist in the process. Ryan and I are very familiar with the success of the biggest artists in the world and know that it was never a one person show, right? Dali had a team of people helping him create work. Same with Andy Warhol. Same with Jeff Koons right now. Damien Hurst. Michelangelo teams of people painting the Sistine Chapel. Don't be scared to leverage resources, provided you stay original to your vision and your art, it's still your art, even if you use other people to help you create it. And to take it to the to almost a nice little comparison there is let's talk about printmaking, right? So mm -hmm. you may be an artist that, you know, you do the digital work and like you're just saying, you might not know how to do it in the physical world. Well, in the physical world, let's say you're, you're a painter and you paint, but you don't know the first thing of printmaking, like to pull your own prints, but you want to have an edition at a 250. Well, you need to, you need to be educated in that. So yeah. that's something Art that Rapture we work uses with printmakers on Granville Island because they got the skill set and the tools and the know-how to create beautiful, exquisite silk screen uh, works of art for us. You and know, it's, it's not Ola pulling the silk screen. It's Malaspina printmakers pulling the silk screen. But then traditionally, just like it was back in the days for that, the artist is there supervising. The artist comes back and checks and proofs. And then yeah. that's where you get the artist proof, the AP. The artist yeah. proofs the works, makes sure they're cool. And then the printer goes for the addition. And the artist goes back and makes sure each and every one's cool. If it is, numbers it, signs it. Yeah. So there's no difference in the NFT space. If you're yeah. an NFT artist, and Paul, great call to action. Like If you're an NFT artist that has established yourself in the NFT space, and you are looking to bridge that gap with your collectors that you have lots of, and you're looking to bring that physical world to it, we challenge you to bring it on. Definitely bring it on. Yeah. And that's the thing is we have the resources anyways. That's, But I mean, it comes from an artist that has already a passion for the work. It's the work itself, as Paul just mentioned. So the medium that we use to make it collectible for the collector is a small piece, really, in the bigger scheme of, of the artist's work. Yeah. Well said. I'm I'm stoked. I, I totally agree. Some, yeah, some and because yeah, because yeah, like we you you mentioned like traditional artists and at the beginning like Paul said that Picasso is one of his favorite. You've got uh, a paint of the lead there, and I really advise you guys to see my seventh episode with Juliana Plexo because she is working in the studio where Dali and Picasso were working, and she's practicing okay. then she's practicing the graphic technique, and she's bringing it to another level on the digital world in the NFT. So that yeah, it sounds awesome. It sounds very Pretty wholesome, pretty a huge idea. And so, so can yeah, you share some of that in the description please. of this video? Of course, I will share in the description, yeah. and I will co I will share also here on the on the right. I think, yeah. Love and uh, so I see, I saw the energy, I saw the passion, I saw a clear way. So thank you for coming here today, and good luck for your drop tomorrow, and for your drops and exhibitions, both virtual and traditional that you are going to have. Thank you so much, Francesco. Absolute pleasure. Thank you for having us on the podcast. And uh, it's been a lot of fun. Thank you. Yeah, for sure, Francesco. I appreciate you reaching out to us and uh, and getting it together and making this work. Obviously, the nice thing and the last point I'm just going to mention is the NFT community. I alluded to it before. This is something that a lot of artists won't get. And this is also something a lot of people in the crypto space looking to just jump in NFTs will not get. If you are not engaging with the community and the nice piece about using Twitter and using that online social platforms is the crypto community 
speaks with each other and shares information. That's the whole reason why decentral applications work is it's open source. We share the code so we can make it better, right? That's how the whole community works. So if you're not on Twitter, if you're not in Discord chat rooms and you're not engaging with other artists, if you're not on Clubhouse listening, even just sitting back and listening, or you're not looking at podcasts and you want to be successful in this NFT space, do not apply. Like, don't even try. You need to be engaging, but not because you want to sell stuff, because you're passionate about it, because it's yeah. something that you want to be part of for more than 20 minutes or this bull run. Because when it gets to the bear market, which feels like right now to some people at the NFT space, but when it actually gets into the bear market in the cryptocurrency world, it's going to be dangerous. It's sad. It's annoying. It's frustrating. People go crazy for it. It's the worst ever. I got wrecked. I put all my money at the top. <laughs> I fell to the bottom and it stayed for two and a half years. Right. So the artists that are there for the love of it, they don't care how much their artwork sells for. Banksy's pieces that sell for millions of dollars in Christie's, he doesn't make a dollar from. It was sold in a as a little print or someone took it off the wall that he did for free. Like they're not doing it for the money. They're doing it. I mean, of course they want to be wealthy in the work that they're doing. That's not the point. It's that it will come if it's done the right way. And that's those are the artists we're working with because that's how we work in our own lives. So I just wanted to bring that up, the NFT community. So come and find us on Instagram. This is the pitch for all the things. I'm sure it's all in the comments below, but um, we appreciate the time. Uh, Francesco, we're going to be watching the podcast. We'll let them grow. And uh, all the best to you and yours, buddy. Oh, that, that's a huge advice. So network and show your face like you don't have excuses anymore you're in the nft world and you need to be everywhere like and there will be i, I can assure you there will be huge of business opportunity from this because you're going to meet amazing people that will propose you something that you have never imagined so thank you for being today here guys uh, see you soon thank all you right, very much man. all the best